I did spend uh, the period of 1997 to 2007 living and working in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Um, I've always been more of an economist, sorry, more of a political scientist, as they call it in America, or just a student of international affairs, as we'd more modestly call it in the U.K. Um, but uh, uh, the U.S. and the U.S. economy have been very much... Uh, I think at the heart of understanding of any aspect of international affairs, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to be able to um, uh, give this talk today. Now, I suppose I'm giving away my, my approach right at the front end, uh, and I don't know if I'll take a straw poll because that might take up some time, and I'll give you uh, time to get into coffee, uh, and I will have a chance in the round table later on to, to come back and let you challenge some of these points. But resilient giant. Um, resilience is a lovely word. Everyone uses it these days. Um, but I think in America's case, uh, it's probably right. Giant is not far off, and I'll come to that in a minute. But I suppose my, my initial answer to the big exam uh, question would be, uh, would be that. Um, but what I want to do in this presentation is link up a little bit the economic with the political uh, and strategic, because in the end, I think these two issues uh, interrelate uh, quite effectively. The two exam questions which I was given uh, right at the beginning um, are these. Uh, does the U.S. still want to lead the world? And is the U.S. Uh, the motor of the world economy? And uh, these two questions are definitely interconnected in my mind. I looked at them initially when I got them from Kofast. I thought, are these two different presentations? Um, but actually, from a U.S. standpoint, it's willingness to lead, uh, to be a motor and so on, I think very much depends on its sense of economic self-confidence. It's fascinating that right now a number of my ex-institutions, I worked at a place called CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., which is one of the big foreign policy think tanks. Um, CSIS, the Council of Foreign Relations, Brookings, are all in the middle of big studies about uh, American economic strength as the absolute uh, precursor and necessity for economic, um, so for broader foreign policy leadership that the U.S. might have. So these traditional foreign policy think tanks have put uh, America's economic strength absolutely at the heart of their research agendas, and they've all gone in the same herd instinct uh, in the same direction. Um, America's willingness to keep an open market economy, obviously, is partly driven by its sense of internal economic strength. And as America's ability to be an institution leader, to push, uh, whether it be in, in, in the WTO or in, other, in the IMF, other spaces, I think is also uh, heavily interconnected um, with its sense uh, of self-confidence economically at home. You know, it's interesting when, when Barack Obama this is a quote of his from 2012, um, uh, but uh, when he, in the lead up to the most recent presidential election, but he had a similar set of lines, which I, I wrote about actually back in 2008, uh, where you had this sort of more multilateral, multicultural US president who was still pushing out this language about America needing to lead the world. Uh, indispensable nation was, was a Madeleine Albright kind of phrase, I think that principally she coined uh, way back in the Clinton administration. Um, but, you know, no American president, whether from the right or the left, is one to be uh, uh, outflanked on its commitment to American leadership uh, in the world. And I think this, is, this sense of, of U.S. ambition uh, is one that could never be uh, underestimated. But there are three elements, as I said, integrated a minute ago, that I think lead to this kind of sense of, uh, of leadership capacity. Economic power, in a way, comes from its economic success. Um, the economic success is an absolute necessity for America's military power and predominance. And ultimately, that military power and predominance, I'll come to it later on as to whether it needs to be used or not, but possessing it, uh, the two previous things, the economic power, the military power, is a really central part to its ability to lead institutionally, to, to kind of mold the international framework in which all of us um, uh, operate and, and work today. So let me uh, start off with the first part of this, which is the uh, economic resilience, um, and uh, just go through a couple of sort of historical, I'm not going to do a look back, uh, David did, but just a very quick take here, uh, hopefully in your charts there, you'll be able to see this quite clearly in your packs. Um, taking a look at an IMF 2010 uh, sense of projections uh, at that point and where historically the U.S. share of the global economy had come from. In this period, code of 95 to 2010, we really started to see the, the big shift in the global economy. Not so much a shift for the U.S., 
which declined only from about 25 to 23 percent uh, share of the global economy through to 2010. But that real flip between China and Japan, I think, was the most remarkable period there. China growing from a 2 percent share of the world economy to about 9 percent, Japan declining almost by, what, by half, 18 percent uh, uh, to 9 percent. Um, but if we then start to look a, bit, a little bit further forward, um, we'll see that the U.S. also uh, manages to retain, to a certain extent, its ability to stay in the big leagues through this whole period. Uh, 2011, this is now uh, OECD 2012 projections. OECD uh, projected or showed in 2011 uh, the U.S. was still representing 23%. Uh, of the global economy, and then looking forward, obviously in very linear sense, through to 2030 and 2060, hitting a sort of uh, an even keel around 18% of the world economy. China rising at this point up potentially to 28% of the world economy. Um, India playing in there a little bit. I mean, I think these numbers, I'm not an economist, I'm always suspicious of numbers, I have no fan charts in here. Um, but I think what they do give a sense of is if you were to ha have a chart back here, which I've used in other presentations, of where global GDP was running back right to a 1,000 years, you saw that global GDP tended to match to a large extent population. And we've had a, quite an aberrational period um, uh, through the middle of the 19th century uh, right up to uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago, where there was a complete disconnect between population uh, and GDP. And China, uh, India together constitute about 50% of world GDP um, up until 1850, something like that. We're returning to that uh, period where population, if properly organized, can start to equal and have an impact on GDP capacity. And the US is pretty well organized, as I'll come to it in a minute. Other countries like China um, are becoming more uh, better organized. India may become uh, better organized in how it manages its economic potential. But this means that the chance for the UK to be able to be a key player going forward um, is that much more uh, likely and that much more positive. Now, I think we have here, um, in terms of uh, US uh, the kind of resilience of the economy, um, we've really hit a point where we can see uh, uh, that 2013-14, if you take all of these factors together, could become part of this positive uh, turning point. There are several factors. Anyone has their list of factors that help drive uh, U.S. economic strength. I've laid out a few here, which I'll come to in a minute. But that aspect of strong population and continuing population growth, a young population, and importantly, uh, its ability to, uh, to immigrate and to allow people to come in and integrate themselves uh, into their economy, uh, the resilience of its banking system and, as I'll discuss in a minute, of its government finances. Um, its energy costs, which of course have become a big feature and were mentioned briefly by David earlier, and uh, technology. Um, if we kick off originally and start off here with, with, with population, uh, you can see how U.S. population uh, is going to continue growing healthily into the future. If you hold a, an EU uh, target up here, you'd get a very different picture. Even China, which is going to probably top out on its population in about 15 years' time, uh, you can see that U.S. is going to continue uh, on current projections with a very healthy pace of, of, of size of population growth. What you do have, though, at the same time, uh, is a, a continuing sense of how you can take the attractiveness of the U.S. economy to immigration into such a way that it can keep integrating its population. And I think the, partly for political reasons, the decision which has now been flagged uh, with the U.S. Senate uh, passing uh, its version of an immigration reform bill just in the last couple of days, there's 11 million people uh, undocumented, illegal workers uh, working at the moment in the U.S. If you can start to bring them into the U.S. economy in a more formal way, which is what this bill uh, is talking about, it could have a very large impact um, on America's uh, uh, resilience going forward. Um, banking system. Uh, people have noted for some time that the U.S. Uh, banking system uh, obviously was right at the heart or the, or the uh, the very eye of the storm of the global financial crisis, but it also took a pretty tough line on trying to uh, get over it and recover it. Um, TARP, the Trouble Asset uh, uh, Relief Program, um, really forced U.S. banks to have to pony up right from the beginning, but already we've seen banks like uh, Citibank, uh, Bank of America, uh, paying off uh, their $45 billion uh, dollar loans, 
Uh, we've got a debt default below 2007 uh, level this year. Uh, common equity is about 12.5%, well above the 9% it was in 2008. Um, uh, the banks, although you know, share prices are still uh, heavily depressed, there's some fear about how uh, Dodd-Frank uh, financial reform will play through to its strength. There's litigation still coming up on LIBOR and so on. But the U.S. banking system is that much stronger and a much better position to be able to drive uh, economic growth and support it in the U.S. And U.S. Uh, personal saving rates have, have picked up heavily from a, a record low of about 0.8% uh, in 2005. Uh, they're now up to about 2.7% um, at the beginning of this, of this year. And house prices, again, just wanted to get a little bit of a sense of, of the differential. The U.S. took a huge knock um, in 2007, but already last year we've seen a big uh, recovery in house prices uh, at the beginning of, of this year through the end of last year, where we still have declines taking place across Europe, which maybe didn't take such a hit at the beginning, but are now finding, uh, in certain countries at least, housing prices uh, still dropping or dropping uh, even more quickly at this stage. Um, the energy boom. Now, obviously, the energy boom is uh, something that everyone talks about. I've got a suitably uh, a complex chart of my own right here. I could have done a chart uh, about gas prices, which is what everyone's talking about at the moment. Uh, this is about actually oil, um, uh, the oil balance, because I think it also paints a very interesting picture, and for some ways even a more dramatic picture. But just quickly on the gas side, um, we've gone uh, a dramatic projection. In 2006, people were projecting that the U.S. would be uh, importing 20% of its consumption. Now the projections are that it will be a net exporter by 2020. And I think you've all seen uh, the gas price differentials uh, between uh, the U.S., where it's about 3 to $4 per, per, per million uh, BTUs, compared to $10 or so in the U.K., $13 or so in Europe right up to 17% uh, in Asia, and obviously this feeding through to electricity prices. But on oil, um, again, very interesting to see how projections shifted. What you've got on the left-hand side of that chart is a projection by that EIA in 2006 uh, of what uh, the situation that it expected to be in 2011 in terms of the U.S. deficit uh, of oil uh, versus consumption. We can see the deficit being in the, the import part being in the, in the dark blue and the domestic production being in light blue. And then that little line running above it um, showing where they saw uh, against the scale on the right-hand side the percentage uh, of, of, of imports um, to the deficit for, for consumption. So you can see they imagine it would be going up to about 60% uh, uh, deficit that they would have uh, relative to consumption. Then jump forward to the middle set of charts where you have uh, the actual situation in 2011, a dramatic change in difference. And if you look at the projections, you've got two sites of projections there of where it could go. One is kind of business as usual that the EIA has done um, going forward. But on the right, um, the world energy outlook projecting potentially an even more dramatic decline in U.S. Uh, import of oil dependency if uh, efficiency standards are pushed through, um, if uh, some of the uh, renewable policies that the Obama administration is trying to push in this new um, in this new uh, second term uh, are carried through. So the U.S. has gone through an absolutely radical shift uh, in its energy picture in the last few years, and again contributing very heavily to its uh, resilience. We wouldn't really be talking about the U.S. if we didn't talk about technology. Um, and I don't even know where to start with this thing. I mean, I think what, what's fascinating here, uh, I put it at the, at the beginning here, is all of the competition really in the technology space right now is about what U.S. company is doing to what U.S. company. You know, Apple took on and, and uh, Microsoft um, to a large extent, certainly in, in aspects of even the PC market and you know, the whole phone side and so on. Now, uh, some of you may have seen recently this, this wonderful cartoon in the FT of Google starting to strangle Apple. Um, and so it, it, you know, you're going from U.S. company to U.S. company. This is a, a U.S. battle that's taking place. Uh, again, another headline that I saw in the FT the other day of, of Google becoming the new General Electric of the 21st century. Um, the U.S. is capable of reinventing itself uh, the technology in remarkable ways. The 3D printing, which you've all, I'm sure, heard about uh, capacity. They even talk about doing 3D printing of food. Um, uh, no, seriously, uh, NASA has put a, um, a, a grant in place where they reckon you could have cartridges of oils and, uh, and, and uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, cornstarch material. You'll be able to 3D print yourself for long space uh, exploration. 
sounds crazy right now, but I wonder whether in 10 years' time we actually might be seeing that. Um, and U.S. manufacturing itself has been uh, picking up partly through the benefit of its uh, energy picture. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, job creation appearing in the auto space, in the retail side, um, and jobs, in essence, are also starting to be creating, starting to be created. The U.S. lost about 2.5 million jobs in the manufacturing industry from 2007 to now, but has regained already half a million of that, whereas across the EU we're still looking at being about 3 million down uh, from 2007 and, and not recovering in the same way uh, at all. Um, I won't spend too long on this chart because I'm going to run out of time if I do. Um, this is actually an old uh, uh, chart that uh, The Economist did uh, back in uh, 2011. But I think it's just fascinating ways of looking um, at, uh, they put this up here really because they want to talk about the Facebook world. Um, and now already Facebook I think is over 900 million uh, uh, um, you know, account holders compared to the populations of various countries. I think the more interesting part has been looking at the market capitalization of some of these companies, uh, the Googles and the Apples versus Toyotas or Boeings, but very interestingly, you look at the bottom uh, versus number of employees, which is part of a big uh, problem for the United States. How they, do they make sure that this creativity and resilience feeds through to the real economy uh, in terms of, of jobs? And a last quick comment on the government deficit. Um, we noted, her, and I quite agreed, I thought, with David's points earlier on about the UK um, uh, uh, in a way still being in a sort of stimulus. I don't quite understand how you can say a country is running a really severe austerity policy when it's still running deficits of 6-7% of, of GDP. Um, the US, which has been much more active in its, in its I suppose, in its stimulus and its uh, deficit spending, saw in this last year a, real, a really quite dramatic drop from, we can see from 2009, 10% deficit down to 4.2% projection now for 2013. It was 7.5% roughly in 2012. Uh, the US seems to have a capacity uh, to potentially grow its way out of its deficit and hopefully uh, grow its way out of its mounting debt um, as well. So 2013, in a way, looks to me a little bit like a, a potential pivot year where the U.S. capacity for resilience is really starting to, uh, to, to show itself to be the case. Uh, and you've seen this in some of the um, IMF and, uh, and other projections where they're looking variously uh, at still a sort of slightly edgy, uh, perhaps 2013, I'll come to it in a minute because of the sequester, but really looking at projections through into 2014, perhaps getting up to 3% uh, of GDP. But Let's look a little bit at some of the vulnerabilities because these continue to be uh, under the surface uh, at the moment. And so any optimism that I might want to lay out about the US in this kind of very near-term 2013, 2014 point, I think has to be tinged with a dose uh, of realism about some of the big structural problems that the US faces uh, today. You all know about its uh, social security uh, uh, deficit, and I've got a chart coming up on that uh, in, in a second. And again, I think therefore, although the deficit may drop a little bit in the next two to three years, it could pick up again in the 2020s. Uh, people don't talk enough about, in my opinion, the education system and the challenges uh, the US has in that space. Uh, I would note that the Chinese patent uh, um, issuance um, uh, something that I was looking at uh, in an article the other day, has risen from 85,000 patents in 2003 to 650,000 in 2013. And China is on a real race to try to move up the value chain to get into technology space. And although the U.S. is way up there, as I pointed uh, out a minute ago, and I think can give it a real uh, continuing... Uh, drive to its growth projection in the next three, two to three years, at some point uh, there's a real risk that it could fall behind. Uh, and unemployment, although great, yes, it's dropped from what the 9% high mark or so after the crisis down to 7.6%, there's a more serious underlying problem, which is this problem of underemployment. That underemployment is a combination of unemployed and people who are on part-time work but want to be on full-time work. Uh, and it's you know, uh, over double uh, the uh, unemployment figure. And I think accounts partly for some of the Fed's continuing sort of sense of, of needing to keep quantitative easing go. There's a lot of fragility uh, in the US uh, jobs market still at this stage. A quick sense there just of, of why that structural problem of entitlement spending uh, is potentially a, a risk for the future. And you can see how the 
entitlement spending uh, in relation to discretionary spending has just diverged uh, so significantly and, and projected to continue diverging uh, through beyond where we are today uh, into the future, um, which is why the whole sequester, um, uh, which we can talk about in a minute, uh, has in a way been a bit of shadow boxing. And the real problem is not how you sequester money out of the red line, but how you tackle uh, that blue line uh, of the entitlement spending going forward. Because it's the entitlement spending uh, that really gives you that risk of the red part um, of business as usual, um, uh, risks uh, looking forward to the future. And again, as David said in his previous chart, they won't let it get there. But if you just let business as usual continue as it is, that's where um, the numbers could go. Again, just one other point that I want to point out, this, which is, ties a little bit into the underemployment uh, aspect here, has been how stagnant median income has been uh, in the US, peaked in, uh, uh, in 99 um, and really has hardly been able to recover since that period uh, if you take it uh, income in 2011 dollars over this period. Um, again, part of that sense of lack of confidence in the middle class uh, that we have in the US, um, uh, taxation that may appear to be low, but having lived in the US for a long time, you experience uh, taxation in many different ways in the US, whether it be in what you contribute to your healthcare costs or whether you want to send your kids to college. There's lots of other ways that you get hit in your pocket in the US. Um, and the last comment on the economic side is the impact of the, the sequester. You know, the sequester, as everyone knows, was not designed to do anything intelligent. It was designed to be such a blunt instrument that it wasn't meant to happen. Um, and so people point out, you know, what a ridiculous way to, to cut, uh, cut spending. No, it was, it was designed to be so ridiculous that no one would do it. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the extent of, of, uh, of partisan gridlock um, and, and this desire not to be able to give Obama, you know, a bit of a boost after winning the election that we ended up um, with, with it being enacted. Now, personally, I think the, uh, the U.S. Congress, this is, a, this is the beginning of a 10-year process, which I think will get adjusted with some structural reforms. But it's going to have a bit of an impact, uh, as I said, in, in 2014. But I don't think so much. It's, it's in areas where quality of life might be affected, uh, the kind of furloughs in aspect of education, air traffic control, parks, etc. But as I said earlier, not hitting Social Security, uh, not hitting Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and potentially, if I can segue into, into the second and shorter part and finish up my presentation, it will potentially, though, have an impact in on the security front. And it's certainly having an effect on uh, what I said at the beginning, the kind of American mental map of where they stand uh, in the world and its capacity, therefore, uh, to be able to project um, uh, strategic leadership. So I do want to just uh, uh, finish up here with a few slides on whether this is affecting, you know, where does America's kind of desire to lead uh, stand today? Um, a quick just skim uh, at, uh, at where the U.S. stands on defense spending, because I think it just gives you a sense of you know, if you cut U.S. defense spending not by 50 billion, uh, but by 100 billion um, uh, in this coming year, which is what the sequester potentially does, you've still got a U.S. defense budget that is just stratospherically high. Now, you've got to remember there are all sorts of numbers in there, uh, including uh, very high personnel costs, uh, taking care of, um, of injured returning service uh, personnel. You've got, you had 100 billion a year being spent on Iraq. Uh, close to that, uh, 80, 70, 80 billion being spent on Afghanistan. So, you know, the, the numbers are, uh, can be moved around there. But the U.S. is in just in another league uh, on its defense capabilities compared to any other country uh, in the world. And even the sequester, even uh, its growing deficit uh, is not going to affect it, not least because there are a lot of jobs inside that number as well. Um, uh, but I think America started to realize that this, this, you know, spending money doesn't deliver outcomes. Um, and uh, if I were to just, again, rather than go through each of the bullets here, just make one comment about this. I think, you know, U.S., the combination of U.S. military power and influence was probably strongest between the, Viet the end of the Vietnam War and uh, 2003 uh, and the use of military power in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, it's been the use of military power and demonstrating its limits that to a certain extent has, has cut back some of, of America's global leadership capacity and put in this more defensive stance where, uh, uh, you know, Barack Obama thinks that, you know, 
uh, I do a lot better on a cheaper option, which is using the drone approach to, uh, to my security rather than having uh, vast numbers of, of military uh, personnel deployed around parts of the world, uh, not, maybe not being quite as, eff as effective. Um, just more broadly on, on institutional leadership, uh, as I said, the third kind of uh, basis of American power looking forward. It's been interesting that, that U.S. institutional power, I think, it has been diluted in recent years. Its voice in the U.N., um, its uh, influence within the IMF, the rise of the G20 as a countervailing you know, sort of gathering group uh, compared to the G7, um, the rise of, uh, of other groupings as well um, to, to kind of challenge it, which I'll come to in a minute. But America and its allies, in a way, are feeling that much more defensive than they were. NATO has become a kind of insurance policy of last resort, rather than as a tool for, uh, for, uh, for projecting international influence. And on the other side, you've got new regional organizations emerging around the world, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the African Union. Uh, you've got you know, uh, Russians and the Chinese and South Africa, South Africa China, uh, India, trying to get together around these BRICS summits. Um, and so democracy is not always proving to be friends of the United States. I think the U.S. Uh, probably feels that a little bit more uh, kind of isolated in terms of its capacity to, to kind of lead and influence the environment in which it projects influence. But to go back to my resilience theme at the beginning, the U.S. is trying to think of ways around this. And uh, one of the points I wanted to, to sort of come towards conclusion on is whether the U.S. can reinvent its leadership, and again, whether 2013 and 14 is a pivot period for this. And I'm sure many of you have been reading newspapers about this wonderful TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership idea, which uh, David Cameron is hoping he will be able to announce the launch of um, uh, next week at the G8 summit, but that's now looking a little bit uh, up in the air because of, of uh, some last-minute hiccups uh, with the French on, on the uh, cultural exception. Um, but the U.S. has certainly given itself a, um, uh, a real desire to try to think about how it can reorganize its institutional influence and its economic influence looking to the future. Um, the U.S. has been pushing, as much as the Europeans, I would say, the creation of, uh, of the idea of a more integrated transatlantic market. Uh, not in terms of just reducing tariffs and so on, which was the idea back in 1995 when Leon Britton first kind of kicked off this, this concept of a transatlantic market, but in getting to those non-tariff barriers, the standards, the regulations, the kind of behind-the-border barriers that can limit uh, the extent of, of transatlantic uh, investment uh, returns and, and trade. And, and the subtext of this isn't just an ability to hopefully drive more growth uh, and jobs in a kind of value-added transatlantic market. It's also the idea that if Europe and America can get together on issues of, I don't know, shale gas drilling standards or intellectual property standards or safety standards for cars or pharmaceutical standards and regulations, that by doing so, they will start to develop some of the rules of the road that other countries will need to, to adjust themselves to if they want to play inside what still remains at this point in 2013 and 14, 50% uh, of the world economy, pretty much, uh, the, the, the US and, and EU markets combined together. So I think America has realized that there is a pivotal moment here to try to bring America and Europe together around a bigger uh, economic project that could define somewhat the rules of the road for the global economy at a time when you can't do that through the WTO when you can't necessarily do it through the G20, where the US uh, is just one voice uh, amongst a, a number of other ones. So I think this, this TTIP idea, which is meant to be launched and kicked off in the next few, few uh, months, uh, will be extremely important. And again, I'll be happy to say more about it at the end. So just to conclude, <coughs> two points I wanted to make at the end. Back to psyche and how Americans think about what they can and can't do. I, I was particularly struck uh, by this poll that was done, um, uh, again, about a couple of years ago. What, who America thinks will be leading the world? If you look on the right-hand column there, you can see that back um, in 1997, um, Americans thought that, you know what, 56%, I mean, the bulk of, of, of ones who had an opinion, felt uh, the U.S. would still uh, be the world's leading nation um, uh, when, they, when they looked ahead 20 years. 
Now you've got a flip where the bulk of Americans, Americans believe China will be the leading nation uh, and, and a smaller proportion think the US. This is a, a really important kind of shift in Americans uh, of way of thinking about itself. And I suppose, you know, uh, means that I think we have to have an element of, of concern about how much America will want to lead. Um, but, you know, my concluding points, I suppose, would be here. 2013 could be the year that the, that the US turns the, uh, the corner. Um, uh, you know, I don't know where the partisan gridlock's going to go. As you probably noted when I said earlier, I think in the end, uh, as Americans have always been trusted to, to do the right thing when they've exhausted every other option, um, and we're in that particular kind of frame of mind right now. Uh, and Samuel Huntington, who I don't agree with on everything, uh, 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 did, however, I think, have a quite a good line about the self-renewing genius of American politics. And he always he, he noted here that if you're going to if you're going to tackle decline, and a lot of the language has been about American decline in the last few years, you've got to know that you're in decline. Uh, and the Americans spent a lot of 2011 and 2012 talking about how it was a power in decline. Uh, I think in 2013-14, we're starting to see it turn the corner. And that's it. Time for coffee.